For those just entering the webinar, I'm gonna wait about 30 seconds to allow everyone to join and then move on with a few opening remarks and introductions. We've got a good crowd this uh, afternoon. Thanks for joining us for this discussion. All right, thanks everyone so much for joining us this morning or afternoon or evening, where depending on where you're calling from. Uh, my name is Archon Fung and I am the Winthrop Laughlin McCormick Professor of Citizenship and Self-Government here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I wanna start with just a few announcements on the behalf of the Ash Center. We would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among peoples and nations. This event is being recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center YouTube channel shortly after we conclude the event this afternoon. You are welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the duration of the event. Please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window instead of submitting them via the chat. Now we've hosted a lot of events at the Ash Center Democracy Program about political conflicts at the national level. And those are very important discussions. And while every healthy democracy also has a healthy level of conflict and contestation, that's part of what democracy means, a healthy democracy also requires solidarity and civic action to find and advance the common good. The news stories that we've all been reading about local conflicts around COVID school closures and masking or the content of curriculum make it seem like we can't even find common good locally. But today's discussion illuminates the ways in which folks in local communities all around the country are building civic infrastructure to live together despite mm. having many different views and to learn how to work together to solve their problems and move forward in their communities. There's no better person to facilitate this discussion than my good friend, Carolyn Lukensmeyer. I've the, had the pleasure of working with Carolyn on many democracy projects over many years, more than either of us care to count. And in that time, I've seen her do uh, amazing things. I remember one of the first times that I experienced the wonder of Carolyn's work was in 2002 in New York. And it was the first anniversary of the attacks on the world that destroyed the World Trade Centers in 2001. And she told me she was organizing a meeting at the Javits Center, and it was going to be a community discussion, and that there were going to be thousands of people there, maybe 5,000 people, she said. And I thought, what are you talking about? That's not possible. A community meeting has, you know, maybe 20 people or 50 people or 100 people. And so I booked my plane ticket. I wanted to see it. I went to the Javits Center and indeed there were 5,000 people in the Jacob Javits Center talking about what should be rebuilt to honor um, New York and the tragedy that was September 11th. And she had organized a meeting in which Actually, all 5,000 people to a one actively participated in that discussion. And it was one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen. She did that work as founder and president of America Speaks, which is a, a, an award-winning nonprofit organization that invented nonpartisan initiatives to engage citizens and leaders in all, all kinds of subjects at large scale. During her tenure at America Speaks, the organization engaged more than 200,000 people and hosted events across all 50 states and around the world. Carolyn is uh, one of the most gifted facilitators, and it's amazing to me. I've seen her facilitate meetings with five people to 5,000, and her skills uh, span that entire scale. Um, also, uh, more, more recently, Carolyn was the first executive director of the National Institute for Civil Discourse at the University of Arizona. Um, it was an organization that was founded after the tragic uh, shooting in Arizona, which killed several people and wounded gravely uh, Gabby Giffords. Uh, the organization works to reduce political dysfunction and incivility in our political system. As a leader in the field of deliberative democracy, she works to, is still working very hard in many ways to restore our democracy to reflect the intended vision of our founding fathers. Over to you, Carolyn. 
Arkan, thank you very much for that extraordinarily generous introduction. I'm delighted to be with all of you that have joined us today. Clearly, we're living in an era where hyperpartisanship and polarization that started in Congress, but over the last five or six or seven years has, like a virus, actually infused itself into our community life in every arena. In some of our families, members not able to speak to one another, where we work, where we worship, so that the capacity to live together in our communities has been deeply, deeply degraded. Obviously, there are many structural things in our democracy that have to be worked on, but all of our conversation today will focus on the issue of how do we live together in community and what kind of civic infrastructures, what kind of skills, talents, uh, gifts do we need to actually rebuild the sense of comedy that allows us to problem solve across our clear differences, which are now deeply connected to our identities. All of our panel members today have been involved in a project called Strengthening Our American Republic, in which we look deeply at the question, what does it take for a community to behave democratically in a sustained way? What does it take for a community that's been deeply divided on whatever the issue to once again find the space, the support, the resources to hear one another with real listening to each other, first as human beings, not first on what divides us. I'm gonna take a couple minutes to introduce our panelists, each one of which will speak on a specific kind of civic infrastructure. At the end of each speaker, we're gonna do a quick poll question to all of you who are with us today so that we can bring your thoughts more into our conversation. At the end of each of the presentations, we'll have a bit of a dialogue amongst the panelists based on what we've seen in terms of your response to the poll questions. And then we will open it up and have some time to respond to questions directly from you as you have entered them as requested. So I'm gonna introduce people in the order in which they're gonna speak. First, speaking about the role and importance of place as a civic infrastructure will be Shamichael Hallman, who we are delighted to have with us from Memphis, Tennessee, where, the, where he is the senior library manager of the Cossett Library. He also founded an organization called Libraries, Libraries as Bridges. Following Shamichael, we'll hear from John Seroff, who is the co-director of the Essential Partners Organization. And he will talk to us about the role of facilitative leadership, essential to people being able to hear one another across their differences. Next, we'll hear from Elizabeth Green, the co-founder and CEO of Chalkbeat, one of today's most innovative sources of local news and how do we rebuild a system in which it's possible for a community to have a trusted source of information and data. And finally, in terms of the civic infrastructures, we'll hear from Deborah Elwood, who is the president and CEO of Community Foundations Leading Change. Most of us are aware that our communities have community foundations, but do we really understand the unique role they play and the resources they can provide? And that's what Deborah will help us understand today. And last, a colleague and dear friend of mine for 30 years, Martha McCoy, who has led everyday democracy since its inception. And we've asked Martha to play a special role today in terms of the way everyday democracy has worked across the country, what are some examples of communities where several of these kinds of infrastructure are beginning to work together? Because like every other arena of human endeavor, if these infrastructures are siloed and not connected and really integrated, we won't achieve the goal that we have of being able to live together finding our differences once again as an asset rather than as something to be fought over. With that said, Shamichael, would you please join us and share with us the role of place in civic infrastructure? Absolutely. Uh, thanks again, Carolyn, for the invitation and for assembling this great panel. 
And also thanks to Dr. Fung and the Ash Center for hosting us. Uh, we begin this conversation on the need for and importance of social civic infrastructure with the role of place. The importance uh, and role of place is one of the major themes of the Strengthen Our American Republic interview synopsis that was published in 2020. It stated that a culture of civic renewal requires dedicated spaces, libraries, parks, community centers, and other places that are convenient and accessible venues. These spaces can be used to cultivate cross-racial, cross-cultural, cross-partisan, and interdisciplinary listening, learning, empathizing, bridge building, deliberating, and problem solving. These are the places that allow us to get out of our bubbles and respectfully engage with one another. These are the places that through dialogue, we can negotiate tough problems and deepen our civic health. These are the places that create a space for us to open our minds, understand our differences, and converse with neighbors and strangers alike. These are the places that allow us to understand our commonalities, celebrate shared values, and engage in creative problem solving. As we think about the role of Play Center on today's topic of discussion, five things for me emerge, which have been formed by my affiliation with the Reimagine the Civic Commons Initiative. Number one, these places must extend a welcome to all, from the most affluent to the most vulnerable, to people from across the political spectrum. Uh, this requires, among other things, intentional uh, internal staff training, community outreach, and a continuous loop of finding authentic ways to engage with different cultural communities. High quality physical design also plays an integral role in inviting engagement and interaction. Number two, they must create opportunities for shared experiences. It is through shared experiences, such as learning new hobbies and meeting and engaging in dialogue with people that we otherwise would not meet, that bonds of trust and affection can be formed. Number three, they must encourage active participation from the community through acts of co-creation and other forms of stewardship. Number four, they must be flexible and, 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 can, and able to be used in multiple ways. When civic spaces are versatile by design, they open up a whole host of programming options. And number five, they must be viewed, managed, and funded in a way that ensures investments work together to produce positive social outcomes for neighborhoods and cities. These places must have the human and financial resources necessary for the facilitation of inclusive, focused, and meaningful dialogue and purposeful uh, conversations. When viewed as individual spaces, we see that these places have great potential and serve an important need. However, an even greater opportunity lies in taking stock of all of these places in any particular community and viewing them as a set of connected civic assets with the potential to serve as anchors needed for conversations, to occur in relationships to be formed. Thank you so much. Sure, Michael, that was a fantastic overview with really great points about the specific necessity and value of community places. Julian, could you please post the first poll question for our participants? Imagine a real conflict happening in your community. Could be school curriculum, mandatory vaccination or masks. How easy or difficult would it be for all parts of your community to come together in a welcoming space to solve the problem? Still a few of you to vote. You'll see the results just briefly, but we're gonna come back to all the results at the end of the panel's presentations. Thank you, Julian. And now, John, would you please talk to us about facilitative leadership as a civic infrastructure? Sure, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you to the Ash Center for inviting me to be part of this. I want you to imagine a person uh, in a small town somewhere who rushed home from work, made dinner early so they could feed their kids before bundling up and going out on a cold night to City Hall uh, for a school committee meeting or a, a community gathering at a library uh, like Jim Michaels, uh, you know, a, a community meeting about where to build a homeless shelter or whether to hang a particular flag at City Hall or which play to put on in the middle school or whether to develop some plot of land on the waterfront, whatever it is in your community, 
And at the meeting, the, the conversation devolves into a shouting match or a monologue from one person or becomes a series of personal attacks. Uh, this person sits in the audience, they want to say something, but it just feels too toxic to be able to share. It, it could feel scary or maybe that they don't belong or their voice doesn't belong. They could go home discouraged, hurt, confused. Maybe they have friendships at stake or a business at stake. They start Googling, yeah, how, how do we have a difficult conversation about, you fill in the blank. And up come a bunch of names. They click on a link and they send an email. Those are the emails I see in my inbox when I get to work in the morning. Uh, my community is falling apart. I don't know what to do, can you help? And the answer is yes. I work at an organization, Essential Partners, along with dozens of other organizations, nonprofits around the country, uh, everyday democracy being one of them, who can help. And the question that I ask first of community leaders is, do you know who to turn to in your community who can help make space to bring people together, to have a different kind of conversation than the ones you've been having? Do you have enough strong relationships across differences of identity, worldview, political affiliation, age, the part of town you live in, to be able to resist this movement towards polarization and hatred. And it's not just in times of crisis. Right? In, the, in the best of times, times of visioning or planning for the future, do you know how to invite all of the voices of the community together to be creative and inclusive and dynamic? And in the worst of times, to be healing, resilient, and to resist that temptation to other people to move towards hatred and violence. I was uh, talking to a friend who likened it to this story. He said, when, when the Boston Marathon bombing happened, most people rightfully, wisely ran as far and as fast as they could from the scene. And a few people ran towards it. And the difference between them is that the people who ran towards the blast were people who were trained and knew what to do. They knew how to apply a tourniquet or to stabilize someone in shock, they were trained. Right? So the question, as we think about community and think about community being an act of courage, living across difference being the promise of our country, the question is, in a community, do you have people who are trained to step into difficult conversations and to design a process where people can talk across these differences in ways that we'd be proud to have our children see? Do we have people who can ask a different kind of question to build a more nuanced, complex, productive conversations that build community rather than tear it apart? Who are those people in your community? Who can build trust? Who can call the community together for this kind of conversation? Who has the social fabric of a community as part of their deepest concerns? It's, it's groups like librarians and clergy and newspapers and community foundations and everyday community volunteers who learn to map a community, design and facilitate. So at Essential Partners and others across the country have trained hundreds of communities to do this, tens of thousands of community facilitators. You listening can be part of this. The first responders to the, the need in our communities for the social, cultural, political crisis facing our towns, our cities, our neighborhoods. You can train them to help them network, accompany them for years as they build the capacity. And then eventually that this becomes who the community is. It becomes part of the culture to stay curious in the most difficult moments. It becomes part of their culture to ask who isn't here who should be here and how do we invite and include them? It, it's, an, it's a vital part of a community's infrastructure to be able to dialogue and deliberate in ways that help people engage. And uh, some people see what's happening at school boards and are alarmed and it's true. I'm excited that people are engaged. We just need to channel that engagement towards productive, constructive, trust building, community building conversations that are inclusive healing and that strengthen our democracy. John, thank you very much. You've given us a real window into what it means to have the capacity in a community 
to rebuild trust and include everyone at the right moment. Uh, Julianne, would you give us the next poll question, please? Imagine a real conflict happening in your community. Again, school curriculum, mandatory vaccination, or masks. How easy or difficult would it be to find neutral facilitative leaders who can help all parts of your community come together to solve the problem? A few more of you still need to vote. We'll leave it open until everyone has voted. Okay, and again, I think I think I misspoke the first time. You're not seeing the results at the end of the poll, but you'll see them all at the end of our conversation from the panelists. Thank you very much. John really focused on the fundamental issue of trust in the community. Our next speaker will talk about another significant threat to democratic ability to live together, and that is truth and facts. As we've watched media become hyperpartisan, as we understand that national media will be very difficult to shift, a lot of focus and creativity has gone into innovation with local media. And Elizabeth Green is here to share with us what it takes to reestablish trusted sources of truth and facts. Thank you. Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, so a quick backdrop of where we're coming from and what's happened. Um, today, there's nearly 200 of the 3000 counties in the United States that are not covered by a single local newspaper. 1800 papers have disappeared since 2004. And of the remaining papers, there's a combination of workforce declines and changes in content approach that mean that by the end of this decade, the resources our society devotes to covering and reporting local news will have declined by more than two thirds since the beginning of the Great Recession in 2008. Facebook unveiled a new tool to display geographically relevant stories to users and their feeds but they found that there simply weren't enough local stories to share with users. And as they noted in their report, about one in three users of Facebook in the US live in places where we cannot find enough local news to launch a product. So why does this matter? Um, and what's the opportunity if we rebuild um, better what used to exist in local news? One reason why this matters is philosophical. We simply cannot have democratic practice without both citizens and their representatives having access to information. News is an important and essential glue informing each about the other. Citizens about what their representatives are doing and representatives about what voters need. At the community and global level, we need a separate institution to do this work of connecting citizens and representatives to information about each other. Without that institution, we cannot have self-governance. So philosophically, I think we can all accept that to have democratic practice, we do need the institution of journalism. We also have research backing that philosophy. And findings enabled by the decline of local newspapers have found that in the absence of a, local, a strong local press corps, we see reduced voter turnout, reduced likelihood of voting across party lines, and increased polarization. Local newspapers have also been shown to mobilize non-voters to vote, enabling civic, a sense of civic efficacy and multiple types of civic participation. So why did this happen? Underneath of the specific strain of civic infrastructure that I'm charged with talking about today, the decline of local news, is a failure to define local civic journalism as a public good. Historically, it was defined as a commercial good. The result was that certain communities in our country, an affluent country, 
certain affluent resourced communities had traditionally had access to the journalism that would connect them with elected representatives, would represent their concerns to those representatives and in turn hold those representatives accountable to them. But that unique coincidence in which markets supported one piece of a public good, not for everybody, but for some in our country has collapsed. And so the opportunity here is to create a movement that redefines local civic journalism first and foremost as a public good, not a commercial one, one that should be accessible and accountable to every single person in this country. And, one, and just such a movement has begun to flourish. Um, just as we see, we saw in the 1960s, the birth of a new sector called public broadcasting, charged with distributing civically and culturally important news and media. And today, a nearly $1 billion sector. In the 1960s, a $0 billion sector. Tomorrow, I believe that we could build a new chapter of public media that looks like the organization that I am fortunate to lead, Chalkbeat, and so many others around the country in which we are devoted to providing those connections between people and their representatives. Um, just one final example, one little example to end my remarks with, I'm a reporter um, by, I don't know, mission, <laughs> vocation. Um, I had the opportunity to be in Newark, New Jersey uh, when it was announced that Mark Zuckerberg was making a historic gift, the largest ever to the Newark public schools. I was one of the reporters assigned by a national media outlet to descend upon the city of Newark, New Jersey, taking the PATH train into the city and cover incredibly rancorous public meetings at which the people of Newark were enraged and confused and disconnected from any understanding of where this money was coming from and how would it be used. They, when I spoke to people at this meeting, I realized that no one knew the very first piece of information that would be required for them to participate, but they cared tremendously. They filled large historic high school auditoriums to share what they wanted the money to go to, but they also had been given nothing to base their concerns around other than a single Oprah show on national media at which the gift had been announced because the newspaper that used to fuel um, news gathering opportunities for folks in Newark to know what would have been going on had been decimated, the Newark Star Ledger as so many have across the country and had no reporters covering education as a beat at all. Um, no, no one's job was to help the people in those auditoriums know how to make sense of this gift or to make their voices heard. Today, we've been fortunate to open a chalkbeat bureau in Newark. And what we've seen is a, not a silver bullet. There, it is very hard to do the work that we're all talking about here, but an opening up of transparency, of accountability, of citizen voice being represented and it's been an absolute gift to be able to be not just a member of the national media descending, but have rooted reporters on the ground and committed. And we can have that in every community on every essential topic if we set our minds to it. Thank you. Elizabeth, thank you very much. And particularly for grounding it in your personal example in Newark in terms of what doesn't work and that we already have the ingredients that will work. Once more, we will ask a poll question. Imagine a real conflict in your community where people disagree about the basic facts. How easy or difficult would it be to find trustworthy sources of information that all parts of your community would agree to use to solve the problem?
few more people to respond. Okay, thank you very much. We're now going to hear from Deborah Elwood, who will talk to us about the unique role and capacities of community foundations to assist in the extraordinary task of building civic infrastructure community by community. <clears throat> Deborah. Thank you so much, Carolyn and Archon, and thanks to the Ash Center. Um, so I'm here to talk about community foundations, which seems a little out of place, I'm sure, to many of you. So for those of you who don't know, a community foundation is a really unique form of philanthropy that is a really well-positioned institution to bring people together to solve problems at the local level. And at their best, they are really important parts of the local civic infrastructure. Now, fundamentally, community foundations are a collection of donors, living and not living, with many different interests and backgrounds, and they make grants to not-for-profits doing a whole range of activities from the local food bank to an after-school program to public policy groups that may advocate for policies to help the poor, for example. But as it turns out, community foundations are much more than grant makers. They're a little like private foundations, yes, and that they have endowments and they do provide grants to charities, but they're also a little bit like government in that they have really broad community betterment missions so they can address a real multitude of issues. And then they're a little bit like not-for-profits in that they, have, they are public charities as defined by the IRS, but they have public boards. They regularly raise resources from the community and can get involved in public policy issues to some degree. They generally are quite diligent about having bipartisan boards made up of a range of people from different backgrounds from, yes, business executives and people who are in the public sector or who may have been in the public sector or faith leaders. They have donors from all walks of life. And then they have staff that know the community well, both sort of the research and the data, you know, as well as the people sort of the leaders that have titles after their names, and then the neighborhood leaders who may not have titles after their names. They often have welcoming, convening spaces or may support spaces like libraries, but rooms that are explicitly used for community use. They often have extensive local relationships that make it possible to bring people together from a variety of perspectives. And then really importantly, they often have access to financial resources beyond their own donors even. They have relationship with regional and national private foundations and really all levels of government that they can then marshal for their communities. So this is really a unique combination of attributes. And because community foundations exist in nearly every part of the country, they really can serve as a vital part of the local civic infrastructure in communities from coast to coast. Now around controversial issues, community foundations can be that trusted place to have difficult conversations. So let me give you an example. In Northern California, after the timber wars of the 1990s, when environmentalists were protesting the logging of trees that were uh, hindering the spotted owl habitat, the community in Humboldt County, Northern California was really torn apart. The community foundation brought together many disparate local economic development groups and using the real facts on the ground, the group created one unified vision, a plan, a set of actions that led to the successful growth of specific targeted sectors. But it doesn't have to all be about managing those highly controversial issues. Effective civic discourse and problem solving needs to be a regular part of the community's work. We need to regularly exercise this muscle. And let me give you another example of how a community foundation in Rochester, New York has been doing regularly using that muscle. So there, they have been part of the creation of an extremely high quality 
the early childhood education system for poor kids in the city of Rochester. They first engaged with parents about their hopes and their aspirations. And as Michael says, this is really vitally important. And then they brought together county government, the local school district, researchers, parent representatives, and donors to braid together child care dollars, state pre-kindergarten dollars, and local philanthropy that allowed for things like good teacher salaries and other elements that we know are critical to a high quality pre-K system. By the way, this was tied to a low stakes evaluation system that provides rapid and helpful feedback to providers. So this group has been meeting for decades in the Community Foundation Conference Room, and they wouldn't still be there if it weren't making a difference. Kids are better off, working parents are better off, employers are better off. So we need to invest in the local spaces and local people and local information and the local institutions that can help us build healthy and widely prosperous communities, which are the cornerstone of a healthy democracy. Thanks. Deborah, thank you very much. And I think you've probably undoubtedly broadened people's view of the capacity of community foundations to play a role in each of these kinds of civic infrastructure. We have one more poll question we want to ask, which is different than the first three based on the unique role of community foundations. We're actually gonna ask two questions, I think. First of all, just how many of you know about community foundations where you live? Not surprising, many of us do. And then we want to ask one more question. Or at least I thought we were going to, there we go. <laughs> so what role can community foundations play in helping communities solve these difficult conflicts? Now, again, you've undoubtedly been influenced by Deborah's remarks but I'd like to ask you to answer this in the context of what you know about your own community. Another couple of seconds for those who haven't yet finished voting. Thank you. Again, we will come back to these results. And finally, Martha McCoy, who has led everyday democracy and works all across the country and has seen examples of this as we all have of where this is working in communities. But Martha is particularly gonna focus on communities where she's beginning to see the interconnectivity amongst the various infrastructures. Martha. I think you're how many, on mute. How, you're how on many mute. of us do that, right? Thank yes. you, Carolyn, and, and thank you, Archon. And it's such an honor to be here at the Ash Center with my colleagues and all of you today. Uh, the organization I lead, Everyday Democracy, has been helping communities build equitable civic infrastructure for almost three decades. We've seen the power of cross-sector and grassroots commitment to building bridges of diverse people to each other, to the institutions that serve them, to trustworthy sources of information and to the convening spaces where they gather. There was a time not so long ago when local civic infrastructure seemed pretty inconsequential to some people. Now I'd venture to say that more people are recognizing how foundational it is when civic infrastructure is weak, as it is in so many places, we see how disinformation and manipulation can distort and undermine civic bonds. The extreme polarization happening in local communities is revealing our country's lack of investment in civic infrastructure. As my colleagues have discussed, each element of infrastructure helps communities strengthen their civic muscles, 
but the real power of civic infrastructure is revealed when the elements come together in a sustained, cohesive way. I'll share a few highlights of what it can look like when a broad cross-section of the community builds civic infrastructure over time with intentionality and with a commitment to equity and inclusion. Each community is unique and the external pressures of polarization they face are different, but there are commonalities that are instructive. So I'll start in Wagner, South Dakota. And 10 years ago, Wagner began an inclusive process of addressing poverty and economic development. A largely white community and the Yankton Sioux community live very close to each other geographically, but they were miles apart in terms of civic re relationships. A small diverse team of residents began to change that. They brought people together across indigenous and European communities uh, European American communities and facilitated dialogue for problem solving and into what they referred to as circles of trust. In facilitated spaces over time, they have explored the roots of the challenges they face and the history of racism that led to unacceptable conditions in their community. As they have sustained the civic infrastructure and engaged more people, they have, they have created more inclusive school curricula, started business incubators that are co-led by the white and native communities, created public spaces that now include welcome signs in both English and the Sioux language, and have begun a regular column in the local newspaper called the Rez of the Story, R-E-Z, <laughs> which is to build understanding across the whole community about what life on the reservation is like. Um, next, I'll move to Montgomery County, Maryland. School district, a uh, very large school district that has been building civic infrastructure focused on racial and intersectional equity for 25 years. Over this time, the school district has partnered with the community to engage thousands of students, teachers, parents, administrators, and other community members in facilitated diverse conversations about race, ethnicity, and culture, and their impact on educational opportunities and outcomes. So in the current moment, when pushback on acknowledging our country's history of racism is happening, they are speaking from real world hands-on experience of what they have been doing for 25 years. Students, teacher, par teachers, parents, and principals are ready to respond. They are helping people understand that having conversations about race in school is actually de-stressing the school. It is actually supporting the school and being better. It is not leading to division. And um, I would be glad to share a bunch of videos that those folks have made uh, saying about what this has done for their school system. Um, ne next, I'll go to Central New York. So Interfaith Works of Central <laughs> New York and Syracuse has created facilitated spaces uh, for conversation about racism for 25 years. Uh, they've come together in diverse dialogues that are structured for personal sharing, building relationships, and developing a shared vision and some ideas and plans for collective action. I won't go into a lot of the results there because they've been building this for so long, but in one example of the strength of the infrastructure they have built, last year, the mayor of Syracuse asked Interfaith Works to convene a diverse group of residents including members of the Onondaga Nation and Italian American community members in making a recommendation about what the city should do with the statue of Christopher Columbus that is literally in the physical heart of their community. And lastly, I'll go to New Hampshire. Our colleagues in New Hampshire Listens have been supporting local communities in building civic infrastructure for 11 years. There have been several cycles over the years in which some people have felt emboldened to shout people down in public meetings to openly carry weapons or to intimidate elected leaders. This is another such cycle, one that is even more intense. Recently, the New Hampshire state legislature passed a law banning the teaching of divisive concepts in schools and the State Department of Education posted an online form where people could actually report on teachers who were teaching divisive concepts. A, a New Hampshire group actually uh, said that they would award $500 to the first person who reported a teacher. So this is the kind of atmosphere they're in. 
in one community where there is a lot of misinformation about what the schools are teaching, the school system hosted a public meeting to explain what they are teaching and to take questions from the community. The schools asked New Hampshire Listens with their infrastructure to moderate. There was a packed auditorium of over 200 people with some people shouting other people's people down. And really the moderator was there to help move it toward a more productive conversation. She told me that her key repeated messages were, these are your neighbors. We can do this. We want everyone here to be able to stay. It's important to listen to each other. You are all here because you care. I think those are amazing messages. So they just started, New Hampshire Listens just started a moderator community of practice with people who are interested and willing to stand in front of hundreds of people who are sometimes shouting at each other and sometimes carrying weapons to learn how to moderate this kind of forum. And they are also training hundreds of people as facilitators. So there are so many powerful stories like this. I, I, it was hard to select which ones. Each one deserves to be told and learned from. And I, I just wanna end with this, po uh, this point. Amid polarization, there are so many people across the country who realize that our current civic infrastructure is inadequate and who are ready and willing to roll up their sleeves to dismantle civic barriers and to build strong civic bridges uh, to really kind of uh, support them where they were weak or even non-existent. So I just want to end on this note, the same note that John ended on, which is this is something you can do. This is some, something everyone can take action on in their local community. Um, it is how we can bolster our communities and how we can bolster our democracy from the ground up. And whenever we feel hopeless, we know that our neighbors are, are oh so close. Um, I also want to say that um, all of this highlights the, the importance of a call for a, trust, a national trust for civic infrastructure, uh, which was one of the major recommendations of the Commission on the Practice of Democratic Citizenship. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for having me. Martha, thank you very much. And we'll come back to the national trust before we finish. The, what's wonderful about what you've done is you've highlighted different sized communities, focusing on different divisive issues, and covered quite a bit of the country. While you were talking, people also were putting in chat. Jeannie DeFazio told us that Davis, California has good examples of this interconnection. And Gregory Moore talked about the Cleveland Foundation stepping out to do this kind of work in a much more significant way. I look forward to the day where we have always a stream of these kinds of stories in which Americans can take heart that this good work is being done and it is being done by our neighbors and ourselves community by community. We're gonna take a moment now to relook at the poll questions we asked you and just see what we learned about very difficult, very easy on the critical elements of civic infrastructure. Julianne, if you could please post that up for us. And panelists, as you see it, I'll leave a space for people to react to what you see. So on question one, uh, this one was very much on the very difficult and somewhat difficult arena in terms of 33 and 48. So 81% of us were on that end of the continuum on welcoming spaces. Just go through them quickly, Julianne, and we'll comment at the end. Uh, we jump to question three, which was about trusted information. That is almost the same level of difficulty, which was at 80% between very and somewhat. Although there were uh, at least uh, some number of people, 14%, 20 people out of the 139 that voted, found this somewhat easy. That's very heartening, and we want to know what communities you live in. If we can go back to question two, uh, the last one. Yes, we actually are delighted that 
Well, okay, question two. Facilitative leaders. And I think none of us are surprised at this because there have been so many organizations around the country training these kinds of skills. So it drops to about 60% between very difficult and somewhat difficult and bumps up to essentially almost 40% that would find it uh, neither difficult or easy or somewhat easy. So I think it is, again, without having specific data, my own best guess is that the infrastructure that is most found a web across the country is training opportunities for facilitative leadership sometimes coming from the faith sector, sometimes coming from the education sector, and often coming from the corporate sector. Okay, we had one question about the foundations, which got popped up briefly. And it was just, how much do you know about, are you aware? 56% of us are, and 44% uh, of us are not. So that may be something after this webinar you'll want to check out in your own community. Let me leave a moment of space for any panelist who would like to respond to what you've seen in the poll questions. Well, I, I think I'd start, Carolyn, just by, you know, Please. Uh, as we think about the first question and, and finding these spaces, I think sometimes we have to just kind of use our imagination of just, you know, thinking about and really um, taking inventory of all of the spaces that are, in, that, that, that are in our community, and I certainly would hope that that, that libraries are uh, uh, one of the one of the few places, one of the first places that people go to. I think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, for public libraries to work anew uh, with the community to establish themselves, to reestablish themselves uh, as places where this work can happen. Uh, across the country, I've seen libraries uh, that are engaged in this work in really meaningful ways. Uh, but I think where an opportunity lies, as you said, Carolyn, uh, is, is is for that sort of cross-sector work to happen. And so um, that's some of the work that I'm very, very uh, passionate about and engaged in right now. Perfect. And uh, Julianne, I don't, we had a second qu poll question on community foundations, but I'm not sure we actually asked that one in the flow. We did. Perfect. This was what the role can be. And people could respond as many choices as they wanted. So 75% know that they do provide welcoming spaces, 65% that they do disseminate reliable research and data, 68% that they do cross-sector problem solving, and 77% that they do present financial resources. That is excellent because it is important to understand that unique role in a community. Ann Lewis put a note in chat that I'd like to highlight, which is particularly if you're with us and if you're from a much smaller community. I'll use myself as an example. I grew up in a small town in Iowa of 4,500 people, which of course did not have its own community foundation. But in that context, take a look at a county region take a look at a particular region, you are likely to find a community foundation that your small town is included in. Any other comments that any panelists wanna share about the poll data? So I wanna ask the panelists a question to converse amongst ourselves before I turn it over to questions from our participants. Since our goal is to have each of these infrastructures in communities, but also to have these different civic infrastructures learn to collaborate, coordinate, link their activities. I'd like to ask each of the panelists to, to share examples of how to get that cross fertilization going in a community. And anyone who'd like, just jump in. I'll jump in. Um, I think that there are a couple of kinds of cross fertilization that I think are particularly important and they're related to each other. And one, cross, one set has to do with doing things that are cross sector, but also that engage informal leaders, or maybe even people who never conceived of themselves as being leaders before. And I think that, I mean, one of the things we've seen is that sometimes as a, a concerned individual who is sparking something like this, who goes to 
another place like a faith community or a library to say, how can we pull people together? And, and then a lot of times that's on the heel of, heels of concern because of a conflict, or it could be a longstanding problem that people just feel like we've never been able to make headway on this in our community. That could be the spark for that, that cross fertilization. And the other thing I would say that I think is really critical that we don't often discuss that we should when we talk about local civic infrastructure is that our physical infrastructure as a country was created in ways that it actually disenfranchises communities and cuts them off from each other. And so in a lot of metropolitan communities and cities, um, there are communities that are side by side who have no or little civic bridges. And I think that um, reacting to this, especially when it comes to racial and socioeconomic segregation, is really important to intentionally bridge those kinds of divides. And I know that there are you know, organizations around the country who are really specifically focusing on creating connections between rural, urban, and suburban communities. Thank you, Martha. Someone else want to comment on that cross fertilization? I'd just like to very, I'd like to just build very quickly on what Martha said, and I think it's important, particularly for those of us who are um, building the table, right? <laughs> who are setting the table and inviting the community to come in. Uh, that it's important to to recognize the power dynamics that are involved in just the very act of being able to extend that invitation, right? Um, and I think it's very important to recognize uh, that often uh, people have been intentionally excluded from that table and that those same individuals often have went somewhere and built their own table, right? Uh, and, and to not just go and say, hey, uh, we're now going to open it up for you to come to our table without recognizing that there's going to take some time to build trust to show that, hey, we're serious about this, right? And so I think, you know, this, this, this notion of engagement and equity and trust we have to know this, that, that, that it can and often takes a lot of time. Sure, Michael, it reminds me of a very important example in Jackson, Mississippi, which where the African-American community in response to the white community really taking over the political process, even though Jackson is a majority black community, is creating a very inclusive table called Jackson Rising so that any of the efforts that organizations like ours might want to engage in would be wanting to be invited to the Jackson Rising Table rather than expecting the Jackson Rising Table to come to us. Great example. Anyone else have a comment they wanna make about this cross fertilization? I just really agree with Shamichael. We really, really need to think about those power dynamics. It's particularly important for community foundations who even though they may be trusted and even handed, they do have significant power. Um, um, but it, and change moves at the pace of trust. Um, but the more that we can find those institutions that can extend those invitations to a broad swath of the community, the better to get those conversations going about um, the issues and uh, that we all care about and where we have some common goals on particular issues. But I really wanna echo um, Shamichael's really valid and important point. Elizabeth, you clearly also were ready to make a comment. Just a, just a very concrete, simple example is that community foundations have been important supporters of this new generation of civic local journalism. And then we've also seen very productive partnerships with libraries and journalists and facilitative leaders to create community space that is grounded in a shared common fact base. Thank you. I do want to open this up to questions that have come from the people who have been participating with us. And Julian, I'm hoping that you might, I have not been trying to track that while listening to our panelists. So Julian, I'm hoping that you might bring up a question from the audience or from the participants that we can focus on. Hi, Carolyn. All the questions are under the Q&A section. 
you can feel free to list to call out any there. Great. I will pull one out of those. Here's, I think this could be fairly quick. Uh, uh, someone is asking the question, what's the relationship between social capital that Putnam talks so much about, i.e. trust and networks and social civic infrastructure? If they're the same, why different terminology? Is one academic and the other practical? Somebody want to, I think we have a pretty quick response on that one. Well, I'll you actually- should give it. I, I, I'm actually, I will be happy to do that. You will notice in our conversation, we talked about trust and we talked about the phenomena of networks linking. So I do think these things are different. The infrastructure is very specific relative to places, people, and information. And I think Putman, Put, excuse me, Putnam is one level above that in conceptualization in terms of, yes, we've got to get back to the trust, to truth, and to building networks. Carolyn, if I could add one thing to that, or, or I please didn't mean do. to jump in. I was, oh, going to, I was going to say, I think of civic infrastructure as democratic capital, and uh, which, is, which includes social capital. So that's another way of conceiving of it. <laughs> And, 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 I, and I would maybe build on what Martha just said. And I think it's important to, 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 to state and to name social civic infrastructure because we are talking about the places, right? We're talking about the people. And just as we are doing investments in our physical infrastructure and in, uh, you know, our bridges, our railroads, and those sorts of things, and we know the importance that those have in our, in, in our society, that it's also that we also need to think about how do we adequately fund this social infrastructure and, and pay for this and, and, and knowing that the, the, the benefits that come from it. So this again, Deborah, I'll pass this one to you. Are business improvement districts a kind of community foundation? You know, I don't necessarily know. Um, uh, I guess, I mean, as I said, community foundations are generally kind of focused around um, endowed ramp making um, and then, but really focus a little bit like not for profits in, you know, the way that they can um, focus on broad community betterment. So maybe others have a better sense. Does so anyone else want to respond to that? Here's something I think is really, we haven't referred to and is at the heart of what's most important to many people in communities. Do any of us on the panel have an opinion that shared experiences combined with economic opportunity are the top two priorities for reducing polarization? I think we all do understand that the huge gap and disparity in economic opportunities are at the heart of what keeps communities from being able to uh, include everyone in these kinds of efforts. Um, John, I think you spoke very profoundly about the importance of creating shared experiences. Could you comment on the link to economic opportunity in that process? Uh, in some ways, it goes back to the conversation about, um, about social capital. Uh, you know, there are structural issues around economic opportunity, and then there are uh, sort of more social uh, connections to social opportunity. And, and a lot of what happens in a community is people find ways of uh, accessing capital, jobs, uh, uh, clients through the social networks that they have. And if certain people are constantly excluded from the public square, if they are constantly outside of the, the discourse or the political mainstream, if they don't serve on boards, I mean, if you just think about, uh, you know, who sits on a board of directors at your local, any local institution. It tends to be, oh, I know a person who would be great for that. We don't go outside of our own. We have to be intentional about that, which means we have to invite people, which means we have to train people 
how to build the kind of networks that people have already talked about. And then we actually have to go to them. We can't just say, well, why aren't they coming? We can't build shared experiences and say, well, we did all this work, but nobody came. Well, they weren't part of the planning. They were, it goes back to what we were talking about before. It wasn't in their neighborhood. It may not be where they feel safe. It's I mean, all of these, all of these pieces are, are aligned. So yes, uh, I think that there is a, an incredible link between uh, um, economic opportunity and the kind of social infrastructure, the kind of um, civic infrastructure that we're talking about. Thank you. I'm gonna go on because there are many really excellent questions here. Elizabeth, I wanna direct this one to you. I, this is from Nadine Shanti. I think the lack of local newspapers that are trusted news sources is a real problem. What can a private citizen actually do to address this issue? Uh, well, thank you for asking. Uh, we, <laughs> um, I, I think one of the elephants in the room here that Shemichael did mention is resources. All this costs money and we just haven't invested in it. It's as simple as that. And that is true as is as true of facilitative leadership and community places and community foundations, frankly, even they can be under-resourced um, as it is of local news. And so giving money is the way to go. Mobilizing money is the way to go. Um, and the you can do that by looking at local nonprofit local news outlets, or there's currently also a um, effort called the Rebuild Local News Coalition that Chalkbeat is a member of that is advocating it, it, something very uncomfortable for journalists, advocating in Congress to have our taxpayer dollars support local news as a part of you know, civic infrastructure, as a part of the um, reconciliation bill. So we can also write to your local representative and say, you support that because that would be game changing um, for local news. And I'll put information in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah wanted to comment as well. Yeah. And Elizabeth, um, um, as you pointed out, community foundations are now really recognizing just how vitally important it is to have local media. And they are doing all kinds of unusual things to either partner with say their local paper or all the way to the Philadelphia Foundation essentially owns the Philadelphia Inquirer now through a really interesting, unique, um, unique business partnership. But as you say, Elizabeth, so they, so they can be a place that can aggregate those resources to support that local media. So I'm going to ask one more question, but we're going to have to be quick because I want to give each of you a chance to close and to end as close to the right time as possible. This question came from James uh, Reiser. Uh, let me just find it again. I lost it. Great ideas and objectives, but will take some time to bring to fruition. Our democracy is at a crossroads today that needs addressed in the next 12 to 24 months or will not continue to be a democratic society. How do we speed up the process? I'm gonna give one response and give each of you a moment to think about the speed up part. Having worked in the field of the state of our democracy for almost 30 years, I feel deeply the urgency of this moment and the way our democratic institutions are under threat. But I also understand that to really put our democracy back on the right track, we have to have a short-term urgent response. And for most of what we're talking about today, we have to dig into a long-term, how do we invest in our communities and bring our communities along back to a place of really living and working together in a much more inclusive, just way than has been the norm in many communities. So having tried to put out the balance of long-term and short-term, I'd like each of the panelists, if you have a notion about how to speed it up, please share. I'm just quickly say that uh, it's gonna take everybody. And I mean, so, it has to happen at a local level. There will be lots of national things that work in both ways. 
but there is nothing stopping you as an individual in your community from crossing the street and finding another individual and, and starting and, and reaching out to a, a library, reaching out to, the, to a newspaper, reaching out to a community foundation and starting now to train yourselves, to build the capacity to, to heal your community. And it, it can all happen in parallel. This, you, you, and you can't wait for anybody. It, nobody's going to come to help you. It, you have to start it. And, and then when you ask, people will come and help. And you have so many of those resources already in your community. Part of it is about revealing those resources and the desire to do that together. If I might build Thank on what Jack said, just very quickly, uh, in addition to going and finding your librarian and, 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 and your community foundation, also go find your neighbor. <laughs> and while Julianne has put in the chat, if any of you who are with us today would like to stay engaged, receive additional information, make more individual contacts like each of us have referred to, you have to enter your email in that website and we will take responsibility to be back in touch with you. It may not be immediate, but every person on this panel is absolutely committed to the building of community civic infrastructure. And if you give us your email, we will see that you get responded to and get connected where you, you can. With that said, I want to give each of you, uh, John, you may feel like what you just said was a beautiful closing statement. <laughs> and each of the rest of the panelists, like, Plant a chance to comment before we close. Martha, can I call on you? Sure. The question that James asked about the urgency and how do we speed this up, um, that has been something that has been on my heart a lot. And I think it's on the heart of a lot of people. And one of the things I would say about, um, about the urgent piece is I think that for us as a society, we're at such a crossroads in terms of facing and our racial history and reckoning with it. And while that might seem very different from the local civic infrastructure piece in every local community, there's an aspect of that. And at the national level, there's an aspect of that. So I would say that awareness at the local level, and it was highlighted in the stories I told, is something that I believe is so foundational to people thinking about the power dynamics of their community to opening up conversations about uh, and real power sharing, not, not just along racial lines, but every, um, every other line uh, that we face in our society. So um, that would be my, uh, how I'd like to, to summarize um, how we move with urgency to the next step. Thank you, Martha. Shamichael. Yes, um, so I, I, I have uh, seen the power of public libraries to bring people together in really unique ways. Uh, every day in our libraries across our country, uh, regardless of geographic, geographic context, people are coming uh, and are finding really interesting ways to, to, to be together and to live together. And, I, I, and I, I get great hope from that. I do wanna do one shameless plug. Uh, I, I do believe that librarians um, while they are doing amazing work, need some additional resources. And so uh, I will be working with the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, looking at the Our Common Purpose Report and bringing together a private convening of librarians across this country on December the 3rd. Uh, if you are a librarian, if you know a librarian, or uh, if there's somebody in your community, your favorite librarian that you think might be interested in this, uh, I'll put a link in the chat. Please register. I will be in touch with them right away. Thank you. Thank you, Shamichael. Deborah. Thank you for this wonderful conversation, Carolyn. Um, you know, I just think we have to start the conversation um, and that, but recognizing that, as I said, change moves at the speed of trust, but this is about building relationships and these relationships really matter to us achieving our goals. I'm just summarize what we've all just said. We need to invest in the spaces and the people and the information and the institutions that can help us tackle these important public problems, but I'm optimistic. Thank you, Deborah. Elizabeth. Uh, 
I just want to say that Carolyn, your work in the SOAR report and bringing many different people together and many of us did, did not know one another, but whose work is so connected um, and then putting a circle around it and calling it civic infrastructure. If everyone here leaves with one new thought only that they're not, they commit to not forgetting, let it be that one because we can all say we demand investment in civic infrastructure. And then we can define as Deborah just did, it is very specific, concrete and achievable set of pieces that all we need to do is resource. And we will be in a very different country. Thank you, Elizabeth. I want to thank the Ash Center for making this panel possible and thank all of you who participated with us today. And I hope many of you did send us your email addresses. And I want to leave you with two very, one very practical thought and one I hope very hopeful thought. Martha already mentioned this, but the work we did at SOAR, we have combined with the work done by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in their extraordinary report called Our Common Purpose, which both Martha and I were commissioners on that work. And the combination of what we've done with civic infrastructure and how to get the capital human and financial committed in this arena is tied up in recommendation 4.1, the creation of a national trust for civic infrastructure. So work is ongoing to ensure that we can link these things across the country and gain investment to create more and more. My hopeful thought. The last interview that I did with National Public Radio, the reporter at the end kind of went off the formal interview and said, you know, Carolyn, you've been doing this for decades. I wanna know truthfully, what do you really think? Are you optimistic that we can get ourselves out of this mess? Or are you pessimistic about getting ourselves out of this mess? And it was one of those moments, I'm sure you've all had them. I didn't even think, I just started to speak. And I said, Susan, it all depends on what I pay attention to. If I pay attention to the national media, both traditional and social, and the stories they feed us about who we are and how we are behaving, if I pay attention to Congress and its inability to deal with things that are fundamental for decades, I'm very pessimistic. But if I deal with the things that I've had a privilege to see and that all these panelists have in their work, I at America Speaks and the National Institute for Civil Discourse, where I go into community after community after community, where I see people doing exactly what John said, just, I'm an ordinary American, but this is wrong, and I'm going to do something about it. When I look at that level, <laughs> I am very optimistic. We, the American people, can get us out of this mess. We've done it before, and we can do it again. Thank you. <laughs>